The Ohio Agricultural and Mechanical College, right here in Columbus, opened its doors in 1873. But now we know it by a different name. In 1878, the Ohio General Assembly passed a law changing the name of the college to Ohio State University. Over the past 150 years, OSU has grown considerably from its original class of just 24 students to over 60,000 and counting. And today, there are over a thousand different organizations for students to get involved in. Now that's a huge number of choices. And for a newly arrived international student, it may seem downright daunting to figure out which groups to join at the same time they're trying to get accustomed to the language and the culture here. With that in mind, there are groups that focus specifically on integrating international students. Up next, we check in with one of them whose sole mission is to connect with these students even before they get off the plane and make them feel at home. I'm from Nigeria. I grew up in Lagos. I decided to come to the Ohio State University because of my interest in storytelling and mathematics. So interestingly, I, I was looking for a place to stay because I was arriving some weeks earlier than when my lease would start. And during a meeting with my professor, he mentioned international friendships. And so I like, signed up for the host family thing. And then I got an email from Judith saying, I'm going to be your host when you come to the U.S. I picked her up from the airport and uh, brought her home and fed her a nice meal and just wanted her to make herself at home here. <laughs> I think the next day we just kind of like drove around and she took me to lunch and she's like, okay, you need to start getting used to American food so that you know what you like and what you don't like. We also went to visit the Columbus Zoo and I, and I got to like see so many animals I hadn't like seen in real life. And the next day she asked me like, what was my schedule? What do I need to get done in school? And I remember Mark printed out the map of Ohio State University. Like, okay, if you need to get here, this is how to go about here. I thought it was important to provide as much support as we can to Ruth because coming thousands of miles away into a new country that you've never been involved with has got to be really mind-boggling and we want to make her feel as welcome as possible and help her as, as best we can to make her feel comfortable, to support her, and just to be there when she needs a friend. They basically helped me like, you know, get settled, know some common places, some common rules, the do's and the don'ts, you know, that might be quite different from where I was coming. So uh, for the upcoming school year, is there anything you need for your apartment? Your mattress is working out? Uh -huh. Okay, you like that. We just wanted her to be prepared uh, once she moved into her apartment and was on her own, that she was at least a little bit familiar with what to expect. So one other thing I was concerned about coming to the U.S. was that as a PhD student, from stories I've heard from like others, it could be little or no time for social activities. I wanted to be more outgoing, like get to know more people, connect to more people, but the question was how? And so through international friendships, they really gave me the opportunity to really tick, tick that in my in my to-do list. Um, so for example, the welcome party, which happens on the first day of the school year, it was really like an opportunity to meet other friends from like so many countries and it was so much fun. So we start off with a welcome picnic and a welcome party to kind of get the students together and to be mingling with volunteers that serve with international friendships and staff and one another. They get to meet other students from various cultures. We have a lot of cultural activities that are American, like the Thanksgiving a Christmas hosting program. 
I got the chance to go to Bern, Indiana, and you know, getting to explore a new part of the US. Getting to like know more about the town, the Amish community, it was so much fun. The Ohio State University is a huge campus, and there are a lot of people there from various cultures. International friendships allows them to connect with American families, to help them perfect their English language, to help acclimate them to the city of Columbus, to give them some experiences outside of the larger city of Columbus, and just be family to them. And that is just a wonderful opportunity that we have here in Columbus with these international students. They're coming to us and we just welcome them and help them to feel at home. A lot of people find it really difficult settling in a new country, in a new environment, different from theirs. But you know, having an organization like International Friendships that kind of you know supports them until they are stable, and you know, not just help you settle in and that's it, but you know, willing to also follow up on how you're doing is very, very important. Just having to feel such um, intentionality is really special that someone out there cares. International Friendship started here in Columbus, Ohio by a married couple back in 1979 who just had a vision of welcoming international students to the United States. So just tracing how far back how International Friendships has been here in Columbus and the thousands of students that they've served, you know, just makes it the more special and also the heart that they have to serve international students from all over the world. As a Christian community, one of the core value that is present in our community is that we are love beings. And as love beings, it's our responsibility to show love to people, irrespective of who they are, where they are from, or whatever their beliefs are in. And so this is like the driving force and this is why even in IFI, we get to celebrate the Lunar New Year with the Chinese students. We get to celebrate the Indian Holi Festival with the Indian students. And you know, just a way of telling international students that we celebrate your culture and we respect each and every one of you, irrespective of where you are coming from. Interestingly, most of the people I, I really hang out to most now are actually people from different countries. And so that's such a unique gift that I've come to cherish. The last several times that Ruth has come, she has brought friends with her. I think this past uh, Independence Day, we had seven, seven of, of them. So in some ways, we are already welcoming other students into our home. And every person's unique, every person's different, and they all bring different blessings to us. I started this in the beginning to help a student become more accustomed to be more welcoming here but um, I think I've gotten a, as much out of this as Ruth has. I call them my mom and dad now and so I can say it's gone beyond them being my host family. I can say that they are my family so here now in Columbus so in the U.S. Our initial intention was to welcome a student for four days and uh, we underestimated how that student would become part of our hearts. And that four days, hopefully, will end up being six years or longer. Every year, thousands of people visit the small town of Clifton, Ohio, for one reason and one reason only, Christmas lights. And not just a few, we are talking about more than four million dazzling lights. Next, we visit the historic Clifton Mill to get an inside look at the work that goes into making this beautiful holiday display. My family, we bought the mill in 1987.
My father and I and our other life were a big part of the men's and women's fragrance business, believe it or not. Gave up the suits and ties and bought this and said, let's make a go of this. My father's always been a big holiday kind of guy. And we bought almost, I don't know, 10,000 lights thinking we'd never need another light again. And didn't know anything about electricity hardly and just threw up lights, you know, as best we could. And people started pulling in saying, wow, this is really beautiful. You know, you should share this. And that was like an aha moment for my father. Now here we are 4.8 million lights later and counting. This year we started the end of August. We will be done probably the week of Thanksgiving. We typically start at the, the far end of this side of the gorge, work our way to the bridge, which is where we are now. We'll go across the bridge eventually, and then we will clear that side and put them all up on the gorge over there in the mill. And then we will do the animated miniature village, and then we're basically done. So we start down there with a line and just start lining it. There's three layers, though. There's the gorge layer, this middle layer, then this upper layer. But if you come over and look closely at any of this, these are literally individual strands. String them, stretch them, put it down, boom, 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 boom. The only netting would be what we call the waterfall of lights. This is a river coming down out of the hill, down and around, and splashes over the end, mimicking the falls. To me, it's the centerpiece of it. It's, there's so many lights in it, it's just like, Original Mills, 1802. That's a year before Ohio was even a state. The original owner was Owen Davis. Uh, he goes way back to General Whiteman and the people from the Revolutionary War that founded this area, basically the Ohio Territory, and started up a mill. We're like number seven family, I believe. Other notable owners were like the Pattersons, who went on, you know, in Dayton history is Patterson Park, Wright Pat, NCR. These buildings are all what you see is original, it's old, basically like a time capsule. The mid 1800s, there was a sawmill and then Patterson had a wool and linen mill and a paper mill and a straw mill and a barrel making mill and a cider mill, gunpowder mills. I mean, there were no factories, so that was early industry. This was part of the accommodation line that went from Columbus to Sensi this is one of the branches. The sawmill shared the same mill race that, that powers us. It was over across the road, it's long gone. This mill has always been a, what's called a grist mill, which is just an old word that means to grind. So flour, wheat, corn, buckwheat have always been the primary product here. People who marched off to the Civil War came here and got their little bag of cornmeal and flour to take with them and stuff. I mean, it's just really crazy to think about that kind of thing. So many people every year say, oh, it's just Christmas lights, anybody can do that. And I'm like, all right, let's see you crawl out on a bridge that's 40 feet above the river in weather with all these cords. Or up on this roof, or that high roof. I'm the only one that goes up there. I don't ask any of my people to go up there. He and I are the main people we have about four or five guys who come after their real jobs or you know, every other day, part-time, to give us a hand. You know, we're up against cities and parks and you know, people with big budgets and big crews. This is little old us. That deck is where you wanna be 
you'll see a little wooden box. That is the switch. 14 200 amp panels all kick in. So it goes from total darkness to just The animated miniature village is a lot of fun. I'm the generation parents would take me and my sister, say, downtown and look at the department store windows with all the cool stuff going on. So that's what we try to recreate. Santa Collection, that's my mother's domain. There are approximately 2,500 Santas of all different ages in the Santa Collection. At my age and, and stage of doing this now, honestly, you'll see me smile a lot when now I get generational people coming up, children of children who came here and had such an amazing experience and they're like, we want to share this with our children and our grandchildren and I'm just like, wow, this is, you know, this is part of why we keep going. In our busy modern culture, community festivals are one of the ways people can slow down and connect each year. And here in Central Ohio, the Hot Times Festival on the east side of Columbus is no exception. Whether you've been in the community for years or you're new to the area, the people at Hot Times work hard to bring everyone together. We sat down with a couple of longtime volunteers to learn more about the history of the festival and why it is so important to the community. Hot Times Festival is interesting. We were there from the beginning. Started on 18th Street. The people who lived in the community would have a table and they'd bring out and bring some stuff that they could show and then talk about it, maybe sell too, as well. It was a chance to buy those things that people were bringing out of their houses that were like heirlooms and stuff. We were the ones that began to show West African drum and dance because that was during the era and the age of the drums and things coming about. This was a chance for us to learn more and share more about the African-centered culture, which we were learning. And then, of course, at that time, you had all the other cultures here. They were showing, too. So it was kind of like, let's everybody come together. So it was fun. Then the music, of course, was interesting. And not till I guess it moved that you got, you know, really start doing with the big bands and stuff. Jazz and all of that stuff. Well, it really, really started going on. And that was just the beginning and the blooming of everything. Now, it used to be just one tent, you know. Now they have three stages or four stages, you know. Because uh, at one point, one of the stages is the one over there in the walkway. We started that because something was happening. We just got on that platform and started doing things. And then they came up, oh, there's a place for a stage. People come all over because they want some relief, some release. It's a way to get away from the news and all of that stuff that's happening 
outside right now. When you come here for that Friday, that Saturday, and that Sunday, that Saturday morning with the parade with the children, and when you come here, you get away from it for a while. It's like a reunion. It's like a meeting place. It's older people, younger people, new people, generations of people, and they look forward to it because the congeniality is just there. It's just there. The spirit here is not like it is somewhere else. Yeah, the general groups pretty much can find their own group here. Their music is on at different times of the day. We got Africans uh, coming from, from Senegal, Mali, Sierra Leone, Guinea, uh, all the places uh, here, uh, Ghana, you know, and not only uh, selling stuff, but talking. Like one of the persons used to be Kojo and his photography. You have people who make jewelry. You have people that send incense. If you name it in the culture, they're here doing that. For me, it's important that I can see my African-centered community out here, people enjoying themselves that way, and I can see other communities enjoying themselves like that. And then, we're, we're, it's not even, we don't even have to talk politics, it's here. And, and, and then when we go outside of, of this here, it, it, it's almost like you're outside of the Magic Kingdom. I mean, it's, yeah, think of those things. It's that's, really, yeah, yeah, it's that's, really that's different. As the Hot Times community sees itself and sees itself growing, it, it always has to take, turn around and look at the volunteers. And when Hot Times calls on their volunteers, the first thing they ask is, what am I getting out of it? Well, most of the time, it's a sense of community for what your community is doing and how does that add to the community at large. They have some of the best volunteers because they're giving to their, their community. They're giving because they want to do. They're doing what they can do and give. We're here because, you know, we're sharing our talents. We're sharing it. Yeah, we're culture. sharing right. and our culture. We're sharing it. You see a couple of guys go by and picking up the trash and you feel good about that because it shows respect and concern and care. It may seem small to someone, but you know what? It's important and it's good to that person that can do it. And you get so much out of even just that. Even for the volunteer person that gives out the programs in the pampas or the t-shirts, it's relationship, it's community, it's feeling safe, it's feeling clean, it's feeling good. It's just like homecoming. When you hear hot times, I'm telling you the truth, people will come. Yeah. They will pass it on down through their family line. I'm talking about you go from the great grandparent, one, the grandparent, to the, you know, to the mother, to the children. Come, you gotta go to hot, this is where we used to be. This is what we used to do. Yeah, different do groups meet here. They look forward to it. it. It makes you happy to know that you can count on it. And knowing that you can count on it this year and then next year and again in the future that's going to be healthy i think it's going to be healthy for the community this is one of my favorite photos in the collection this is called giving thanks it's a photo of the boyman family eugene and esther and their son david in their first thanksgiving in columbus in november 1949. the story behind how they got to columbus is really just a phenomenal one so esther and Eugene were both in concentration camps in Europe during World War II. Esther's family, their business was raided and they were sent to Treblinka concentration camp first. Esther's mother and her three sisters were murdered there. She was then sent to Auschwitz after trying to escape and was in a displaced persons camp soon after the war in 1945 where she met Eugene. So they met in displaced persons camp. They were trying to get to the United States in 1945 when World War II ended. And Esther and Eugene made their way to Columbus. And this was a photo that would have been printed in the newspaper. They arrived in 1949. Eugene went on to work as a tile setter for Duratel here in Columbus, and they had three more children after David. For me, it really shows all that we do have to be thankful for and how resilient people can be through such tragedy to be able to start a new life. 
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on YouTube or columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on social media. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Angels and drummer boys hang from the tree with colored lights flashing. I wait eagerly to open the